Hi, welcome to the class today. So, so far we have already completed the entire course content, which is specified by service now for system administrator, certified system administrator. And these are those additional topics which we'll cover in the next two, three days, uh, because this is kind of a value add which we are doing as a part of this training. This is not a part of IT, uh, sorry, service now certified system administrator course as such, but it is important because uh, if you want to start a service on journey as an, as an implementation specialist or as an, as an administrator, then the first thing generally you work on service now ITSM module. And that is where we will have to do all these three things. But before that, before moving into service now ITSM or service now problem incident change, let us first understand these terminologies at a very basic level, at a conceptual level, what, what is an incident? What is a problem? What is a change? And what is ITSM all about? Why do they keep talking about ITSM all the time? <clears throat> so let me start this, right? And this session will be more of theoretical in nature because uh, there is no practical in this case. So the, the moment I shift my things to service now ITSM incident module, that is where I'll show you things in practicality. But today's session is more of theoretical because here we are trying to understand the concepts, okay? Now ITSM, this is a very common word in IT industry. And it, the full form of that word is IT service management. So with the, with the statement itself, it is quite clear that it is, it is about all about managing the services which an IT company provides, right? Now, to, to manage those services, you have to do certain things. You have to do a lot of, lot of things. So there are a lot of best practices in the market which people follow. Now, to achieve that objective of managing your IT services effectively, uh, there is something called ITIL. And it is uh, right now it is a registered trademark for Exelos. Exelos is a, is a company who has this particular <coughs> trademark called ITL. And ITL is the most popular service management framework across the world, across the entire globe, right? So there is nothing better than this as far as IT service management is concerned, okay? And recently they have come up with something called ITL4 in 2019. Before that it was ITL version three then two, then one, of course, uh, when we go to the history, we'll see that part also. So what is ITIL, first of all, and why do we do it? So the whole reason, why do we do it? First of all, it is a set of those best practices, a framework which guides you, how do you manage your IT services? How, how does it help that it aligns your IT with the business? Because what happens is sometimes people think that IT itself is, is a business, right? Uh, which is not the case in the most of the cases. Apart from technology companies, uh, the core uh, core business companies, the core financial organizations, anything, healthcare, insurance, or uh, you know, banking and everything, all those sectors have their own business and they use IT as uh, to leverage their business, to, to expand the business, to manage their business. Right? So when you do IT service management, you kind of align yourself with the business values also, that you understand what is important for their business. For example, if I say that I am operating a retail banking business, and I want my users to log into net banking and <clears throat> do a certain transaction, transfer money or something of that sort, right? or check the balance or whatever. So in that case, it will always tell you that from business perspective, what is the criticality of each and every function, each and every module for their business, which means maybe download historical statements may not be top priority, but making a payment is a top priority, right? <clears throat> so every business in itself has its own critical versus non-critical functions. So they, I mean, as a part of overall offering, they offer a lot of functions to their customers, but some of them are top priority. Some of them are less critical. That is where, uh, when there is an issue, then you understand uh, when you practice this ITSM, you understand that which issue is more important, which is an issue with the highest priority because of the kind of uh, stakes you have for that particular issue. That is why it says it aligns IT. So if you follow the standard of IT service management, it aligns IT with a business model. And that is the whole objective of it, that if you are not aligned to busy, you, you can say on your own that, okay, my, my side network is working fine, everything is fine. I do not know why there's a problem, but that does not stop uh, the whole conversation, right? Because they'll always come to you that people are not able to access it. People are not able to log into the system. There has to be some issue, right? So you cannot just, you know, shake off your hands and say, no, no, there is no problem. So this is where you have to understand that you as an IT provide that value to the business because of which they're using your services, right? So you need to understand that where are those gaps, where you need to do that analysis, you need to align yourself with the business values, with the business models. That is where you are being treated as, as a valuable partner. 
it delivers services the standardized model because as i said it is a set of best practices we will be uh, using those best practices and then when you have processes and practices in place then you can deliver a services with a certain set of standards it does not matter that person a is delivering it versus person b is delivering it or team a is delivering it or team b is delivering it because all of them are following a certain framework and because of that framework framework people really don't matter what matters is the process behind it that is where it helps you it didn't helps you to increase the value and roi of it services because if you have less downtime for a business partners if you have given them a lot of value at features this is where you can get yourself more value you can uh, you can show them that we are quite valuable for you because we have been able to do all of these things for you that is where your returns on investment also increase because clients have that confidence in you they give you more projects uh, of course so it generates for revenue everything right and uh, it also helps you to adapt quickly to changing business needs so for example earlier when people were working in waterfall board of sglc for developing projects uh, it was quite <clears throat> it was not like like you no know, quite an adaptive measure it is quite a waterfall kind of thing where things happen at their own pace now, right now the market is quite fast i mean everything has a quick turnaround time you cannot just take ages to resolve a problem resolve an issue for them or if there is an enhancement required in a system you need to be able to do that quickly so this framework helps you to adapt to those changing business needs quite quite fast you also optimize resources and cost because you kind of automate few things for them so once you automate things then they don't have to kind of you know uh use some person for the same purpose again and again because they now know that this problem is happening because of this reason and because of that they have already created some kind of documentation which they can give to the customers so which means that and then your resources can actually be used somewhere else in more value adding functions right even in the cost so because uh, for example if you are doing uh, it assets uh, you are doing that check whether how many assets are lying underused so all of that happens when you do all these practices which are prescribed in in it service management then you can also manage business risk and service disruption failure sometimes you know there you must might, might have heard of a term called bcp business continuity plan so something goes wrong at the primary site then you should have a capability to invoke the operations from the secondary site which is called as dr disaster recovery site so all of those kind of things uh, that you decrease the out outage for business and all those incidents for business and you add value to them this is where it helps you to <clears throat> manage all those business risks and uh, disruptions or failures right and so so it is as i said it is a registered trademark of excelos it is it is the most popular uh, framework right now in the world for it service management it was also aligned with the international international standard called iso 20000 it is in public domain so most of the things are available publicly that what is it what is it not about it is vendor neutral that so whoever is following it they they know those terminologies everybody in the world can talk to each other in the same same terminologies they if i say incident then anybody who knows itl will also understand what is incident so it does not really matter which vendor you are using for your services everybody has to follow the same standards and it is used by the largest companies right now and as i said uh it seems that it is a word there uh, on in the front but to be honest if you ask me itil is a framework which is followed across multiple business functions forget about it companies it companies are of course using it but there are <clears throat> more companies in it uh domain which are using it because it gives them a standard set of things practices framework which allows them to manage their services quite effectively so even an insurance company they'll have the back end of these things in, in in the to offer the services to customer we'll we'll come to know about that in some time but my point is that itil is not only used by it companies the name suggests it but it is not that way it is used by a lot of things non prescriptive which means it has a certain set of standard guidelines and frameworks and then it is up to you that what is your pain point and to resolve that pain point what things you want to take it from that particular prescription so which means that it does not tell you you have to do this you have to do this you have to do this it will tell you these are things you should do and you can take from there that, okay what is it which is applicable to me so you don't have to follow the complete itil for any organization because every organization works differently they have own their own pain points everybody is on a different radar so they use those things as per their needs so they don't have to 
implement the entire ITL uh, to do everything, they, they might take whatever suits it. It is a process based, right? Uh, that as I said, <clears throat> when you define the process, then it does not really matter that which people are involved to do that process because if they are trained properly and they're, they're made aware of the fact that you will be kind of um, assessed or evaluated based on the processes you follow, then everybody has to follow it in a certain way. Uh, set of best practices and um, yeah, it is no longer an acronym for information. So earlier the full form was Information Technology Infrastructure Library, ITIL, the full form. But right now, they said it is used by everybody. So that is why they just prefer to keep it uh, ITIL rather than uh, talking about Information Technology Infrastructure Library. So that's the whole understanding. I mean, why? What is ITIL? Why? So this gives you the framework for IT service management with the help of which you can manage your services. We will talk in detail in further slides in terms of what are those services, what are those other practices which you follow here? We will talk about that in certain time. Now, just to give you some kind of history, uh, so version one, ITIL version one was published in 1998. Can you see that time, time frame? Right? It is quite an old thing in the market. It, is, it has been there for more than 20 years now. Version two was there in 2001. So this is where it, it continued to 2007. So everything has a life. For example, this version one, was there in market from 1996 to 2000, from around five years. It has 34 volumes of book. In version two, you had it launched in 2001. It continued to 2007. And after 2007, they launched IT version three. And after that, they did some kind of upgrade on that in 2011. That is why it is called as ITL version three 2011. Right now, when I'm taking the training, even 2011 has been uh, uh, deprecated. And right now they are on ITL version 4. And they don't call it version, they just call it ITL 4. You see here, right? ITL 4 has been launched in 2019. And it also talks about the principles of agile, lean, DevOps, automation, because uh, people are facing some certain problems with version 3. They were saying that it is not quite agile. It, is, it does not help us to support DevOps. It is quite uh, volume. It is quite heavy in terms of uh, principles, processes, and, and roles and responsibilities. So can we make it a little lean? Can we make it more agile? Can we make it uh, as per the latest market technologies? Uh, so that is where they came up with this ITIL 4, 2019. And uh, now it is being uh, used extensively. So right now, every company, whoever is having ITIL as a background for them, they are trying to upgrade to version 4 in terms of uh, managing the ID services, and they're trying to encompass principles of agile, lean, DevOps, automation, all those things, because this is something which is, you cannot ignore them, right? You cannot work in a traditional mindset. You have to emerge continuously. You have to show them that this is where we have improved. And that is why it is very important to keep on upgrading it. So right now they are using version four. We'll talk about at a high level, the differences between version three and version four, I think. <clears throat> but again, as a part of this whole content, the reason I'm telling you about ITIL because it is something which provides you the framework for IT service management. And there are some modules, there are some, some processes in IT service management, which we use in service now also going forward uh, in terms of incident, problem, change, request, knowledge, all of those things are there. So we'll come to that point in some, some time, right? So it was till uh, 1980, it was still with CCTA, it was a company. Uh, then it was Office of Government Commerce UK till 2001. Then it was acquired by cabinet office, then Exelos. And right now, recently, even Exelos has been acquired by PeopleSert in 2021. So PeopleSert, you might've heard, it is an organization which kind of helps people in certifications for different industry frameworks. And they have acquired Exelos now. This is just a bit of history and context. You may not need to remember all of that. It's just to set up something in your mind that, okay, this is how it evolved. And this is where we are today. This is how we started some time back. <clears throat> Any questions on the history and context part? Again, as I said, quite theoretical, just need to know about it. And then we'll see how will it be applicable in service now world in some time. Yeah. So if no questions, I'll move forward. So in, in <clears throat> you have these five things at the core of ITL. One is service strategy. Then you have, so which is the core here, service strategy. Then you have service design, then transition and operation. And then you have CSI, which is called as continual service improvement. Now let me explain this part a little more to you. This is more interesting part. Now, for example, I 
as I said, you don't need to use it for IT services. So I will give you an example of a normal situation rather than an IT situation so that you can relate it better. For example, I have to open a restaurant, right? Now, to open that restaurant, I need to understand from strategy perspective first before I start designing it, before I start operating it. I don't start from strategy perspective of what kind of restaurant do I want to open? Will it be continental? Will it be Indian? Will it be Mughal? Will it be uh, multi cuisine right? What is my customer base, which I'm trying to target? How much money will I have to invest to get some returns after some time, right? Which is that locality where I have to do this? Similarly, if I talk about a real estate project, right? And somebody is coming up with a new real estate project, they have to think about all these things, okay, Am I targeting lower middle class? Am I targeting upper middle class? Am I targeting luxurious, uh, this, the, the rich class? Or am I targeting poor? Uh, whatever is the, is the plan for them, right? Which is a locality where they would want to do it, right? So this is what gets decided in strategy here. That is why it is core of everything. So you decide everything here and then you start uh, designing it and transitioning and operating it. Now, if I kind of compare this to the IT companies organization, then you know people like CXOs, you have CEOs, CIOs, uh, CFOs, CISOs, so all of those CXO kind of layer, which is the top layer of company. This is what they do. They define the strategy. Okay, should I be merging this with this company? Should I be acquiring this company? Right? Should I expand into new businesses? Should I shut down this business? Should I? Uh, should I? You know. Uh, <clears throat> kind of improve this, this business, I am getting some revenues. If I kind of take some leads here, if I improve the services, maybe I get better revenues there, right? So all of those strategy related questions, which kind of decides which way the company will move forward are happening at this level. That is why it is called as the core of idle, right? Now we talk about then, then what happens next? Just imagine, right? So I have decided to open a restaurant. I have decided that it will be a continental restaurant in a very posh locality in this particular part of the city, right? Now I have to design this. I'll come up with blueprint. Okay, this is what I am going to offer to my customers. This is how I will design the entire. Thing. When I say design, which means you talk about the entire, uh, the way you will design. For example, let's say the example of real estate, right? So they will come up with a blueprint first of all. That what is their model? What kind of design they have for the entire uh, uh, entire project which they are trying to build on, right? How many amenities will be there? We have thought, we have already got answers to some questions in strategy level. Now, based on those inputs, which we got from strategy, we'll have to design things on the paper first. Okay, this is how it will, because this is where you don't do the analysis work. This is where you do the thinking work and just, just do the uh, strategy part. Okay, this is, I think, should be done. Now, CEO will tell you, go ahead and give me a plan in next three months and tell me all its and buts and tell me how feasible it is. Will I be able to get my returns investment? Right? Will it be actually, uh, or maybe he can give you two or three options. Okay, this is one thing I'm thinking, second thing I'm thinking here, third thing I'm thinking here. Tell me which is the most viable option, which is the most feasible option, which is the most beneficial option from business perspective. Because anybody who's opening business is not doing it for charity. You should, you should remember it, right? So anybody who is in business will always want to generate more revenues, more profit, because he has to feed his own people also. He has to expand his own business also. That's his own whole intention, right? But this is where, <clears throat> once he has decided it, based on all those factors in terms of uh, what kind of services do they want to offer? What is their portfolio, right? What is it that they can offer immediately? What is it that will come sometime later in the game, right? How secure? Now, if I talk about, for example, IT services here, then it will be a concept of how secure these services are because right now security is no more a luxury right? it is it is a, a prerequisite for launching any new it service because a lot of cyber attacks are in place a lot of cyber crimes are happening right now security is, is a very important aspect for example they'll have to think about all the security the performance issues for example are you able to so if i launch a website will i be able to take that load which is expected from my from my consumer base maybe thousand transactions per second will i be able to take it right if i have to take that load what kind of underlying infrastructure will I have to arrange for it? So all those design level discussions. So when you say design this, right? Design means all that creative thinking, all that analysis work. Okay, if I do this, this will happen. If I do that, this will happen. So all those kind of stuff uh, before actually doing building it 
you design it in your mind, you design it on a paper, and this is where you come up with a blueprint. This is how it will look like. This is the cost for which I will sell it for my customers. These are the agreements, service agreements I'll have with them. For example, if there is a priority one issue, I have to resolve it in maybe 30 minutes. Do I, do I have the capability to do this? If yes, then only I should be committing my customer that I can resolve your issues in, in 30 minutes. Right? So for example, uh, you see the example of uh, Dunzo or, or Swiggy delivery right, right now, the Domino's Pizza, they say, tell you that, okay, we, we offer you in 19 minutes or 30 minutes. They must have done some design work in the back end to commit this assurance levels to the customer. Because without doing that, they will be lost. They will not be able to meet commitments to customers and they will have to go back. So to, to offer all those commitments, to offer all those service assurances to a customer, you need to do certain work in the back end to ensure that you have the right level of capabilities and resources to deliver to those commitments. So all of that discussion, all of that analysis thinking goes here. So this is a very, very important state. So here it is about ideation. It is about conceptuation. It is about thinking at a very high level. This is where those things come into on paper and you see the real things. Okay. I have thought so that if I, if I kind of acquire this business, I'll be in profit, but looking at this analysis, which my team have done, I don't think I'll be in profit in even 10 years. So why should I move into that area? Let me focus on something else. So this is where your service design really, really matters. And this is where you design your entire services. There are a lot of things under it, but as I said, uh, uh, <clears throat> we are just talking at a very high level right now, just to give you the basics of it. And third thing is that our own objective is how will it relate to service now eventually? That is why I'm not going into too deep. Otherwise, IT, SM, ITL foundation course itself is you know around 20 hours. So we will not go much into detail. But I hope you understood the concept of service strategy and design, at least at the high level. What is strategy? What is design? And this is then transition. On transition, this is the real work which you do. The building. You, you, you actually start creating the building. Whatever you've designed on paper here, you start building that in reality in this area. So if you if I compare it to IT, I if I compare it with IT companies, their whole SDLC cycle, right? So you know that they have something called uh, design. Discovery is the first thing which they do, then design, and then they do design analysis here, then they do development. So that development part where you're building all of that is actually happening in service transition. All your SDLC teams sit here. This is the area which is generally you know, all those functional solution architects, your technical solution architects, your, your enterprise architects, all your senior folks, they sit here where they design things. This is where your entire development teams, your testing teams, your, your business analysts, all of those people sit here and they build the entire thing, whatever has been designed and agreed. <clears throat> this happens in service design. In case of example, as I said, building then, the, you are now making the entire building and this is where you do the actually you this is where you actually do the development part so you build you deploy you test design happened here build and test happened here and now when everything is ready you are giving position to customers for example if i talk, take the example of real estate you've done everything now you're giving position to customers so this is where the service operations come into play now if i talk into it services perspective you you must have heard about production support teams who are actually supporting those applications which are already live in production. So those, the, the, the go live part of the application happened here already. Once you transition from design to operation, that is why it is called as transition because you're transitioning from design to operation, which means here it is on paper, here it is on reality. And you have started generating revenues. And to do that, you have to transition from this process. Right. Now, when you have done all of that, then this is the area which is generally owned by the, the service operations teams, uh, the teams who are managing that business day in and day out, the, the re requests from the users, the issues they're raising, the, the changes they're expecting. So all of that happens here. So for example, if I've done a building and now I've given the position later on, there might be some problems. So I might give that feedback back to service design. Okay, there is a problem. I think you have not thought about it. We are fixing this right now. Can you fix it? So all of those enhancement requests will go from operation design again. And then again, they'll build it, they'll again send it to operation. So this continuous cycle will continue to be there, will be there continuously. And this is, as I said, uh, if, it, if I talk in IT terminology, this will be a production support team, which generally takes care of this part. Now, all of these things, there is an 
overarching layer of continual service improvement because you always have one room open <clears throat> and that room is called as room of room for improvement and it is applicable in personal professional whatever kind, kind of life you would imagine you always have a room of room right? so you can always improve things from where are they today so you can improve things in service operation you can improve things in service design level you can improve things in service transition level. You can improve things in service strategy level, the way we are thinking. You can change that also. That is why there is this overarching cycle of continual service improvement, which tells you, okay, this is where we are today. This is where I want to reach in next five years. And <clears throat> this is my improvement plan. And based on that, you will take some actions. So all of those things, you can take an action, this level, this level, this level, whatever, wherever you want to take the action. But then because it is applicable to all those life cycles of the service management, that is why uh, this is called as continual service improvement. So the, you'll get input from all the areas and whatever is decided here gets back to these areas for implementation. So this is the whole service life cycle. So this will give you a very wider perspective of thinking that if somebody is thinking about launching a new business, they generally go through all these things in their mind. They might not do it as per ITL terminology, as per ITL practices, fair enough, but they have to do this in some way or the other, because without thinking all of these things, you cannot actually launch a new business or a new product or a new service for that matter. That is why it becomes more important to understand this entire life cycle. This is where it, it actually helps you to understand the concept of IT services. <clears throat> do we have any questions here? After understanding this life cycle in terms of how our service is managed, let's understand a few more. We have been talking about service, service management processes. Let's understand these definitions first before we go any further. Right. So when I say service, and this is where definitions play a very important role. People used to tell me in my school days and college that you don't need to remember definitions. I, I'm that's fine. But you don't may not by heard it. But you need to understand the definition because that is the only thing which tells you that how this entire thing is, what, what do we mean by this entire thing? So if I just read this definition, it will give me that entire understanding whatever I am trying to achieve here. Which means it says a service is a means of delivering value to the customer by facilitating the outcomes that customers want to achieve without the ownership of specific costs and risks. Very Interesting definition. There are a few words that are important here, which we need to understand. And again, it applies to every, every uh, single service, whatever you offer, whether it's IT service, whether it is not an IT service. For example, you want to go from place A to place B. So what is the outcome? The outcome is that this is the outcome you want to achieve, but you want to go from place A to place B. Now for that, what you do, you have hired a cab. Now you've had a cab, right? Now you do not need to bother about did the driver fill the petrol? Do I have the right driver in place? Right. Uh, so is the car inflated enough? I mean, the tires, they have air or not. Is, does the car have petrol? This is not your headache because those service providers like Ola or Bear, they are owning that particular cost and risk. They are not expecting you to intervene into that and look if it is available or not. All you have to do is to go from one place to another using their cab services, which means you have achieved your outcome, which you want to achieve by moving from place A to place B without thinking of their cost and risk and what is it that they have done in the back end to ensure this service. Are you bothered about that fact? No. And you have delivered the value. So they have delivered this value. Value for you was to achieve that outcome, which you wanted to achieve, right? For, for example, if I talk about your mobile, right? Now you have, you might have Airtel, Vodafone, Geo, whatever you have connectivity in your mobile, right? You don't need to bother about how many towers they have stood up. How many people do they employ? How will they offer the services? How will they make sure that on uh, special occasions, your network does not go away, right? Uh, you just need to pay a price of that particular value or outcome, which you want to achieve the customer. That I want to be made, able to make a phone call I should be able to use internet on this mobile if I've taken a services. Whatever they do in the background is not your job. 
that is why it is very important to understand this definition of service. It is a means of delivering value to the customer by facilitating the outcomes that they want to achieve without the ownership of specific cost and request. And this is for customer ownership. They don't want, customer does not want to take ownership of, do you have a data center in the background? Do you, what is that arrangement you've done? I don't need to worry, worry, worry about it. I'm just paying them a certain cost and with that cost, they should be managing their own internal things to give me value. This is the whole concept of service. Now, what is value here? Very, if I talk about value, it is actually utility plus warranty. There are two concepts in value, utility and warranty. Now, let me explain the same concept here. When I say utility and warranty, then utility is fit for purpose, which means I, sh I should be able to use that cab to reach from point A to point B. But if I say warranty, now, if what happens, what will happen if that tire bursts in some time because there was less air or you run out of fuel in some time, right? That is why it becomes all the more important that apart from utility, which means the main purpose of that, you should be giving them warranty that it is fit for use as well. For example, if I talk about that example of mobile network, your network goes down again and again all the time. It, it has performance issues. It has availability issues. Sometimes it is not available at all. Sometimes it goes very slow. You can't access internet when you want to, right? So all of those things are, are together. So they cannot be seen in silo, which means when I say value, I'm talking about both the parts of value. One is utility plus warranty. And it is always from the perception of customer, not from the perception of service provider. And this is what I have been trying to convey the message that always value is the perception of customer. They should be able to achieve that outcome which they want to achieve, not you as a provider. You are achieving your outcomes in terms of the revenues from it, fair enough. But then if you are not able to give them the right value, for example, right now, everybody offers internet banking, right? Unless you have those interesting features which are important for them, unless you have the guarantee for them that, okay, the site is working 24 by seven, your a customer care is working 24 by seven, you will not buy that service because you, whenever you buy anything from anybody, you always ask for the warranty. Will it work under this condition? What will happen if I do from move from here to there, right? So all of those kind of things, apart from the basic concept of does it solve the purpose for you, it should solve that concept for you also that it is fit to use as and when you want it to use, you as a customer want it to use. That is why it is always a customer's perception of the value, not the service provider perception of the value. That is what the concept of utility warranty. Nowadays, yeah, so in ITIL 4, what they've done is they've said that it is about co-creation of value, which means it is not the sole and whole responsibility of service provider only to provide value. Customer will also need to give the right inputs to them, right requirements to them. That, okay, this is what they're expecting. And when both the parties are in together, okay, yeah, this is what you're expecting, this is what we can deliver, then only you should be doing an agreement. And this is why the concept of co-creation is in place in at 4, where they say that both of the parties have to be involved to create value together co-create value. But then it does not change the basic definition of service. It does not change the basic definition of value. Value still means utility warranty. Service still means that, yeah, there are a few things which customers do not want to own, but they want to achieve the outcome. That does not really change. What changes is the way you approach the entire thing that customers will also need to give you the right inputs and the right requirements. They should be able to drive things properly. They should also be able to remove any, out, uh, remove any obstacles you're having to deliver value for them. For example, you're not getting the support from them and they should be also uh, responsible to provide the right support, right? So we talked about service. Now service management is all about, you know, you have, how do you manage this entire service with the set of those capabilities and resources that I was talking about some time back that now you understand the definition of service. Now you have to deliver those services. And to deliver the services, you need some resources and capabilities with you, right? You, for example, I have told uh, the, the mobile, phone consumer that I will be able to give you the service and you will not have any drop call drops. You will be able to use that as and when you want. They need to do some arrangements in the background to ensure that happens. And that is what is called as specialized capabilities and resources. They need to have the right set of people. They should have the 24 by 7 call center. They cannot just commit it without having it in the background. Right? So that is how the concept is. Processes. Now, what is a, and this is where, if you remember, we talked about initially that this entire ITSM or ITIL is process-based thing, which means they define certain set of activities 
which you do to achieve a particular objective. For example, if I say I have an issue, then input is the issue. Output is the resolved issue. And you are doing something in, in, in the middle of it to resolve it. You have the entire process designed for you that, okay, if, if there is an incident, then I'll log it in system. I'll identify it. I'll diagnose it. I'll, I'll escalate it if required. I'll resolve it. And then I'll restore the service back to the cust for the customer. This is the output you're giving the customer, a resolved incident or a restored service. That is why a process is always uh, a set of activities which you do to achieve a particular objective. We will talk about it in a little more detail when we talk about incident problem change uh, as a process. But these are the general characteristics of a process. It should be measurable. That I should be able to measure that, okay, uh, how is my incident management process working? Or how is my problem management process working? How is my change management process working? Is it successful or not? And it is always triggered by a specific event, which means, can I, can I do incident management without having an incident? No. I should first have an incident in place, then only I can do some kind of uh, incident management, right? So it always gets triggered with certain things, with certain events. For example, I'm monitoring certain uh, infrastructure and from that monitoring, if I get an alert continuously, then that is a trigger for me. Maybe then I'll translate that to an incident or I'll just resolve it as an alert. That's a different question, but there is some trigger for me to invoke that particular process. Okay, we have designed it, defined it, but then we need some triggers to invoke it. Now functions. So you in every organization, you have certain set of people who do, who do a certain set of function. For example, if I talk about customer service team, right? So they are those 24 seven call center people uh, who you call for any issue. Then they might, they'll create a ticket for you, for example, and then once they create a ticket for you, then uh, they might escalate to L1, L2 team, technical team, whatever team management, whatever that they will do. So if I talk in terms of IT organization, uh, then uh, if I, let me just talk about this little bit here. So if I talk in IT operations perspective, service desk is one function, for example, then you have IT operations management, you have application management, you have technical management. So when I say IT operations management, I'm talking about those command center guys, those facilities guys, the data center guys, they are actually in IT operations. Now, uh, when I say technical management, all those infra teams like server team, network team, database team, storage team, desktop team, middleware, all those network teams, all, all those all those uh, infra teams are actually called as technical management because they are there to do a certain function. They are there to support you from infra perspective. This is only for customer services. Uh, and uh, you have application management. And these are the people who are supporting those applications. For example, I am doing support for HR SAP application in an organization. Then I am from that team. And you might have uh, development guys. You might have production support guys everywhere, right? So. The idea is that there are four functions in, in idle. Uh, one is service desk, one is IT operations management, one is application management, and one is technical management. This is the customer facing thing, 24 by seven types. So uh, this is your command center facilities, data center guys. This is the team which manages the applications which are hosted on that particular infrastructure. Now, if they have an issue with the infra, then they'll go back to these people only. And they'll say, okay, my application is not working because the server is down. So if server is down, then this team has to come in picture. So all those functions are there and these are four functions defined in idle. Let me go back to the previous one. I think, yeah, so we talked about functions, processes, values, everything here. So the concept level we understood. Now, as a part of this particular course, we will not go much into detail about design, strategy, transition, because this is not something we have to worry about from service perspective. We just need to worry about from IT SIM perspective that there are four, five processes in this operations, which we have to follow. One is incident, second is problem, then you have access management, then you have request fulfillment, then you have event management, right? These are the five processes which we follow in service operations because these are the ones which happen day in and day out. I mean, when a service is live in, in the system, then your customers will raise requests for any incident. They have any problems, they'll raise it. They have an access request, normal request fulfillment. I need a mouse, I need a desktop, I need a laptop, I need a Apple device. And if there are any events, uh, which are for monitoring tools. That is also you do as a part of operations. However, as a part of this course, because ServiceNow ITSM module does not include event management as such as a process because event management is included in ITOM, IT operations management. And we're talking here about IT service management. So uh, as a part of this particular slave, and they have not also talked about change management in this process because 
generally change management uh, from ITIL perspective happens in service transition. It is, it is an overlapping mechanism between service transition and service operation, but uh, I will, I just told you that what are the five operations in, in ITIL service operation function uh, life cycle, but from service now perspective, we'll talk about incident problem change. Request and knowledge, if you remember, we have taken already. We have covered request management, knowledge management as a part of service now discussions already, right? So we will not go into that right now. We'll focus on incident problem change, okay? But this is where you have this, uh, leave this particular part. I mean, this is not something which is important at this point of time. <clears throat> now, let me talk about certain definitions. This is where it becomes, it will be a little theoretical in nature as I told you earlier, but without knowing these definitions, it will be difficult for you to understand why are we doing this? What is it that we're trying to achieve? That is why I've just put in those important definitions, which are important from you to understand, even when you implement service now ITSM for any client. Okay. There are certain set of definitions which we need to understand. And then we, once we complete these definitions, then we will go to service now incident problem change modules to understand how that works in service now. Now, what is an incident? So I think we've been talking about incident problem change for a long time now. I've so shown you some, something when I was taking service now classes also for CSA. All those list view forms, you generally most of the things we are doing in incident. Now, what is an incident first of all? So if you read this definition, it says an unplanned interruption to an IT service or reduction in the quality of an IT service is called as incident, which means something should be working. For example, your net banking, it is expected to work. And immediately when you have logged in just now and it is not working. So which means it is not, and they have not announced that there is a planned downtime for my internet banking or my mobile services for that matter, which means it is an unplanned interruption to your services which you're consuming or reduction in the quality of an IT service also, which means that for example, you have a primary and a secondary uh, failover thing in the back end, and your primary has failed over and secondary has taken over. In that case, you might see some reduction in the quality because of performance issues, because one server may not be able to, or you, maybe you have a load balancer and that load balancer is not working fine. So only one server is taking all the load. In that case also, you might have reduction in quality of service. However, it may not be, it may not need to be resolved immediately, but definitely there'll be some reduction in the quality of service. That is why it also needs to be termed as an incident. It also needs to be managed as an incident, maybe a lower priority one. But if there is an interruption to your service, in that case, you can decide, okay, for example, my somebody is telling you my internet banking is not working. Now you ask the question to them, what is not working? Well, I'm not able to download historical statements, but I am able to make transfers, right? So in that case, maybe it is not a top priority item. It is an incident for sure, but not a top priority incident because the core business told you already that the top functions are making a transfer or checking account balance. If you're able to do those two things, then it is not P1. And then the question come, how many users are getting impacted? Is it happening for the entire customer set for one single location, for one single uh, uh, you know, geography or one single kind of consumers we have. So all those things will come into play when you talk about incident. And this is where it helps to determine the priority of the incident. Right? Okay, how, how to prioritize that incident? Is it like priority one, priority two, priority three, priority four? Because your, your, your SLAs, which means that time which you've committed to customer in terms of resolving that particular thing will change immediately. If it's a P1, maybe you need to resolve it in 30 minutes. If it is a P3, you might need to solve in eight hours, which means it gives you sufficient time. For example, you have multiple incidents right now at your queue. You cannot work on all of them together because you are again a human being. So you'll be working on one incident at a time. Now, which of that incident you should be picking up will be determined by the priority of that incident. And the priority will depend on the factor that what kind of interaction do you have? So anything, so for your understanding, anything which is supposed to work and not work. I give example of mobile services, right? For example, the cab example we take, some, somehow the tires were bust, right? It is an incident. Fuel run down is an incident, right? You are doing anything in your uh, normal life and something, something broke down. For example, let me give you this example to you as well, right? I have some headache right now. It is not that much, it is, it is manageable. I'm not worrying about it so much. It is because it has not interrupted anything in my daily cycle, I'm still able to do all the functions. 
Now that headache has increased a certain to a certain amount, now it started hampering my work, which means whatever services my body is providing me, it is not able to provide this service because I cannot do my work. It is having an impact on me directly. That is where it becomes an incident and you need to kind of manage it. So anywhere, wherever you see something supposed to work and is not working now, you should understand that it is an incident. This is where it differs from requests because sometimes what happens when you sit on the customer service desk, then they kind of uh, you know raise everything as an issue. Oh, I have a problem here. I, I cannot do this. But this is where you have to understand. First of all, was it working before for you? Did it ever work for you, right? Because you can take out the fact from there. Actually, is he asking for a normal request or he's talking about an incident? Because uh, sometimes you know he has not, never done it before, but he is asking for a particular, for example, a software he has to install. That is a request. That is not an incident, for example. However, if that software installed already on his machine, he was able to do his work, but now he is not able to do his, his work because of that software problems, then it becomes an incident. So this is where those basic troubleshooting questions that, okay, since when did you start facing this problem? Did it ever work for you? All those basic questions are there, which can help you to understand whether it is a request or it is an incident because the request is generally, you know, I'm asking for a mouse, I'm asking for a keyboard, I'm asking for a laptop. I'm asking for a printer to be working for me, configured for me, right? So all those basic things are called as service requests. Wherever something which is supposed to work but not working is called as incident. This is where you should be able to determine the difference between incident and a request because in a lot of organizations, this is where the biggest problem is that they kind of manage even requests as an incident or sometimes even incident as a request. This is where the problem happens because you have to manage them accordingly. You cannot manage an incident as a request. Similarly, you can manage not manage a request as an incident because the entire concept will change. The service delivery will go for a toss completely in this way. Now, when I say incident management, that is a process which is responsible for managing this incident, whatever we talked about. Now, if you if you understand it a little deeply, right, the whole purpose of incident management process is to ensure that whatever service was there earlier, it is restored to its original shape. And whatever impact we had on the users is minimized. At that point of time, you may not want to do the entire root cause analysis, what went wrong, where all of that discussion may not need to happen at that point of time. You don't need to you know, dig down the grave there, but you just need to ensure that whatever it takes to resolve that issue at that point of time, I should be doing it. For example, just rebooting a server, right? Now, there might be some processes hung. You have some Java processes running. Uh, it might have taken the memory. Why did it take the memory? Why did it go all of a sudden? That you can do. You can do all of that. That's not a big problem. The problem is you should be doing that after that incident is resolved. So to resolve that incident, you know that I have to either restart a service or I have to restart a server. If I do any of these operations, for example, that at least the service will be restored. Whatever user is complaining of, that will not be there. And we will be back to the normal business, which is fine. You can do that later on. And to do that later on, you require problem management process. Now, I'll tell you some very important thing here, which is what you have to keep in mind, because this is where most of people get confused now. Let me make you understand this. Problem is always a cause of one or more incidents, which means that there is a problem already because of which you have an incident, but you are not aware of that incident unless Sorry, you're not aware of the problem unless you have seen this. In, for example, let me explain this part to you, right? So you had a problem in your, uh, sorry, you had some stomach pain. You don't know what it is, but you've taken, uh, you've taken a medicine and uh, the pain is, you, your body is restored. There is no more pain. You've taken a painkiller. Now, tomorrow again, it happened. You've again taken a painkiller. Now you are kind of confused why it is happening every day and I have to take a painkiller because it is not the right thing to do every, every day, right? So now you will find out what went wrong with my stomach because of which I had the pain. You will do some diagnosis, you will do some tests, and you'll find out there was an appendix in my stomach. And because of that, I had this incident every day. So understand this, right? Even on the day one, when you had the pain, it was because of that appendix, but you never knew about it at that point of time. You were not aware of that cause, but it was there. So so just understand this concept that problem always is the cause of incident. It is not other way around because people generally think that incident after incident due to the problem. No, no. 
after incident management to the problem management is the right thing to say but it does not mean that problem comes after incident problem is always before the incident it is just that we come to know about that problem only when that incident happened because we never cared about it before we never diagnosed about it we never did some kind of checks around it what was happening that is why a uh, problem is always a cause and incident is always an effect however as i said that generally people don't care about problem they kind of restore things by rebooting server or by taking a painkiller so when it happens repeatedly that is where people tend to think okay there is some problem i guess let me figure it out let me do some tests and then i'll see what is the problem for that process you do problem management where you actually identify the root cause of the problem and ensuring that you are fixing that root cause permanently so that at least this incident does not happen now of course for example this appendix operation you have done uh, to to fix it permanently you will not have stomach pain but does it mean that you will not have headache also have headache because headache is happening from because of some other thing it is not happening because of that particular uh, appendix which we talked about right? so the concept is that you might do problem management on the back of an incident which is fine because you are never aware of it but conceptually problem is always a cause of incident and incident is always a effect of the problem right but you do problem management just because you know about that incident just now and then you are saying okay let me find out what the problem is and that is where you do the problem management so generally in the real world problem management happens after incident management whereas problem is always there before incident that is the concept i want you to understand very well because 99% people do not understand this concept quite well Okay, I hope that makes sense to you. I think we talked about service request already. Any questions on this this point? As long as you are able to understand difference between incident problem. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's talk about change. Now, what is a change? Uh, if you remember, I talked about that op operation for appendix. That was a change in the appendix, right? Uh, maybe uh, reboot. We talked about rebooting server. So rebooting server was not a change as such. it is a change in it terminology that because uh, because there was some problem you kind of changed the state of the server it was up and running you made it down and then you again made it up and running right so that would be change in that direction but then the generally the change is either it is requested from the from the customer that okay i want this particular service this particular product please enhance it accordingly that is a change anything which you do on those services uh to ensure that services are all up and fine and then customers are satisfied so any addition modification or removal which you do on those services are called as changes and changes is a very prominent part of any it organization where they have lot of changes to manage so they will have to make sure that they are doing bug fixes also they are also doing enhancements they are also doing the changes for fixing an incident for example and that is that calls for emergency change for example if there is an incident which is happening and to fix that incident you have to kind of uh, make a change in the system for example you have to change the heap size of the system that is a change right you are changing the setting in the system you are making the service disabled you making the service enabled all of those are actually because they are actually changing the configurations of that system at that point of time so all of that is a part of change and your id service management tells you that you should always record a change in system so that people can understand them back of it and they can take the corrective actions how are these things correlated we will talk about it also in some some point of time now there is a concept of change advisory board so these are the people who kind of authorize the change okay we are good we have seen the we have done the evaluation we know that this change can go ahead it will not have any problem it will not have any impact for the other components of this particular application so uh, we are authorizing it let's let's implement it so they kind of help you with assessment prioritization authorization and scheduling the changes this is called as change advisory board and cap so of course the concept of change management is the whole objective of change management is that you are making the positive changes which means successful changes uh, they should be benefited benefiting your organization they should be benefiting your services and they are causing minimum disruption because whenever you are doing a change for example you need to reboot servers you need to uh, you know do certain things which require downtime so which means there will be disruption because of the change and that is why generally these changes are done on the weekends when the business is not up and running but either you have made some arrangement that okay while i am doing this i'll be having my system on 
services and resilient infrastructure, which means there'll be no disruption. Or you have communicated your customers in advance, okay, this is my agreed time of planned maintenance. So I'm doing this maintenance right now. So right now, uh, it will not disrupt the services because we're not using them right now. It is always already a maintenance window for us, right? So that is why changes should be done in the maintenance windows which are defined for that changes. <sighs> right, configuration items. So if you remember, we, we were seeing the CM service or CMDB some time back and I've shown you how are different components related to each other, which means how an application is hosted on a server, how a database is hosted on a server, how that server is connected to a switch, how that switch is connected to a storage device, how are all of them placed in a particular uh, data center, right? So all of that configuration item, all of those things which we are using to deliver the service, they are called as configuration items. It includes services, hardware, software, buildings, people. But in terms of service now technology, we will restrict ourselves to all those hardwares and softwares and services which we generally uh, talk in the configuration items. How are they related together to deliver the entire service? That's the whole concept of configuration item, configuration management. So on this item, you do the management. So for example, if I were to change anything on a server, I have to raise a change record. That is why all your configuration items are under the control of change management. Whatever change you do on any, I have to change uh, disk size, I have to change memory, I have to do anything. I have to raise a change for it. So that I can understand where will it impact if things go wrong. If there's a downtime, will which all services will it be impacting? That is why this configuration management becomes very, very important. EMDB, we have seen already in service now, that is the same database which kind of stores all those configuration records, manages them together, and you have all those relationships, you have the attributes of those items. What is the memory, what is the CPU, what is the relationship? I mean, how the server is related to my application, how the server is related to database, all of those things. That happens in configuration management database. Now, known error. What is a known error? It is, for example, you have done the investigation of a problem, you are doing the, in the problem management, and you've identified a workaround. You know that I cannot fix this problem permanently because of n number of reasons that it requires a lot of resources, it requires a lot of cost to fix it. So I'll live with it for some time, I'll accept the risk, I'll, I'll make it as a known error and I'll create a documentation. But whenever this happens, people can use this known error and they can actually fix that particular incident or a problem. But they cannot fix it permanently because of certain reasons. That is why you manage a database called as known error database, which is called as AEDB also. And this is what people use in their, uh, if you remember, we talked about knowledge bases in service now, right? So in that knowledge base, you kind of create these known error articles and people can troubleshoot they can fix their issues by following that particular article. This is what is called as KEDB, Knowledge Zone Error Database. And then we talked about service level agreements. So this is that particular agreement which you have with your IT service provider and customer. For example, you as an IT service provider offering to serve services to customers saying that any priority one incident we will resolve in 30 minutes. Any priority two incident we'll resolve in two hours. So that kind of agreement which you have with the customer, and then they can penalize you for that. They can uh, file cases for you for that. Okay, there was a even incident. You said you have not been able to fix it in two hours or thirty minutes, whatever the time frame was. They can they can uh, raise penalty against you. This is what service level agreement is. You kind of do an agreement with the parties, relevant parties, saying that this is how I will give you services. These are my assurance capabilities, commitments to you, and it depends on. OLAs and UCs. Now, OLA is called as operational level agreements, which is between different teams. For example, database team has a different OLA. Server team might have a different OLA. So, uh, it is a team. I know. Just, just a minute, yeah. Sorry. Right. I'm talking about service agreement. So, this is where uh, the dependent OLAs. So, OLAs is called as operational level agreement, which is between different teams. Okay. So, database team has an agreement with network team or they have the agreement with everybody that, okay, whatever you come kind of issue raised with me, I'll fix it in this time. UCs are underpinning contracts, which are with the vendors, with the suppliers, third party teams, because you might be supporting an application, which is actually managed by third party. So they will also commit to you something before you commit to customers. So those are cases for service agreement. Now this is ITIL 4 um, and uh, 
we will we'll not talk about much about it as i said if you remember i talked about co creation of value i talked about there is more focus on agile lean devops and automation it is more iterative in nature rather than you know a waterfall so they have earlier they had 26 processes now they have 34 processes so the processes those incident management process or problem management process that has been renamed to practice now and they have classified them into three different areas general management practices service management practices and technical management practices that's the only thing and there are we will not go into this detail right now because this is not important for you so we will skip that part uh, what is the service value system what is service valuation you can read it offline maybe we can have another class on it but right now from service no perspective we don't need to worry about sps and sdc but yeah there are some changes i said uh, which is important to understand that co creation of values there they have renamed to the practices they are agile lean devops automation and then we will talk about these processes when we look them in system later tomorrow right so we will see that incident management process problem management process change management process and we will see that in system also how does it work yeah so for now i think i've i've completed this idsm basics for today and tomorrow we'll talk about incident management thank you